For our scripture reading this morning, we turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we'll begin our reading here at verse number 8. So 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 18 through 23. Paul's the writer here of this letter to the church of Corinth, and he says this, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. Whether Paul, or Apollos, or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come, are all yours. And ye are Christ, and Christ is God's. All right, at this time, our young people are dismissed for their time downstairs with uh, Miss Randy and Connie. And we'll ask uh, Brother Jeff Black to come, come up and present to us what God has laid on his heart for us this Sunday morning. here, and uh, I thought Pastor Dan wouldn't be here. No pressure this morning. There's another thing. <laughs> so now the pressure is back on. No, I, I'm okay. I went through five weeks of preaching for Pastor Dan when he broke his jaw, and he sat here, so uh, I'm over the pressure. Thing. This morning we're going to look at something that's titled, Why Do We Pray? We oftentimes pray, we say, I'll pray for you, or I'm praying for you, or will you pray for me? You ever thought about why do you pray? That's what the food, the thought I want to plant this morning going into this. I'm going to give three examples we're going to look at this morning of prayer in the Bible. We're going to start Old Testament, and we're going to end up in the New Testament. And if uh, things get long, I'll break off and use the third one to see. But uh, I think I'm going to be able to get all this squeezed in. Our text verses this morning are coming from James chapter 5 verses 16 through 18. We're not going to spend a lot of time with those. They're basically the reference verses that I started with, just for the message. <clears throat> James chapter 5 and verses 16 through 18. It says, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Let's open in the word of prayer. Dear precious Heavenly Father, Lord, it is good to be in your house this morning, and Lord, we praise you that we can call it your house, and help us to remember that the church is made up of the people. What the people can do as a church is to pray. So, Lord, I pray this morning you would open our eyes, give us wisdom, give us something we may not have known, give us something that we can grab onto as we win to this upcoming week. As we know that we're already shared. We're in a world of turmoil right now. So, Lord, just open people's eyes, ears, open to the ears of the teacher as much as those that are being taught. Share something with us that we need this morning. Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. So why do we pray? Notice here it, was, it says the effectual fervent prayer. I think that's where sometimes prayer gets lost. Because mostly people say they'll pray for you. It's used in rather a loose, per se, flippant way. I've, I've known atheists that don't even have any idea about salvation. And they'll say, you're in my thoughts and prayers. They don't even know what they're saying. But why do we pray? Because... One, we have faith that God can and God will. We know that our God, the one and only true God, we're going to look at that this morning, can. He can bring hope to the hopeless, which we see a lot of that in this world today. He can bring power to the weak, healing when nothing else can, give wisdom to answer in any situation. Where do you go first when you get into a situation? Do you go to God in prayer or do you go to the world? We're going to look at that a little bit. 
He can provide our every need. Not every want, but He can provide every need. He gives rest to the weary. Probably my favorite that I have mixed in here in the middle. Our God is a chain breaker. If you have something that's just wrapped around you, but every day and every day it just drags you down like an anchor, God can break that chain. Our God can save whosoever, sorry, whosoever will come in faith, believing and ask. We pray to the God that has that power to forgive even the vilest offender. And our God will make a, us a light in a dark world. Boy, do we live in a world today that needs light? Wow. I don't even watch the news anymore. Quite honestly, I don't have to watch the news anymore because I hear it from everybody. You see what they did here. You see what happened here. How can they do that? It goes on and on and on. So I don't even watch the news anymore. I trust God. And lastly, this morning we want to look at some examples of God's power to answer when His people pray. You turn back to the book of 1 Kings chapter 17. That's where we're going to start this morning. We're going to look at the example of Elijah. And we can go all through the Old Testament. We can go all through our Bible. Quite frankly, that we see examples of prayer. We see examples of men that prayed fervently. We see examples of men that prayed knowing that God could. And they knew God would. That's why they went to prayer to God. We're going to look at the example of Elijah. We're going to start in the book of 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 17 through 22. We're going to lead up to the final, which is most people familiar with, when the, the prophets of Baal and, and the prophets and Elijah went with the, the sacrifice. That's where we we'll end up. We're going to start out, first of all, the 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 17 through 22. And this was... Another major time that Elijah went to the Lord in prayer. It says, It came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. So backing up a little bit, Elijah was instructed by God to go into this city and he would find this, this widow lady that would provide for him while he was there. He went. And she had barely enough food to make one more meal and her and her son was going to die. But he said, you prepare for me first, and the oil will not dry up. The flour will not wither away, because I'm here, I'm the man of God. So that's the, the woman in faith did that. And now here we see in verse 17, her son has fell sick, and we see that it was so sore that there was no breath left in him. Her son has now actually died. Her reaction in verse 18 and she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee? O thou man of God, art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? So right away she's blaming Elijah for bringing the wrath of God upon her. And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom, carried him up into a loft where he abode, and laid him upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, Hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came unto him, and he revived. That's the power of God. That's the power of prayer. But that's the power of a godly example. Now this, this woman, if she didn't have any idea about God before, she now knows through Elijah's answered prayer that God is real. God is very real. And she sees Elijah as the man of God. Notice in verse 18, she already recognized that. She said, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? So she already connected Elijah to God because of the food, the physical. She knew. That never dried up. This man must be of God. But then when her son died, just like many times we do, when the circumstances we can't talk. When the circumstances get flipped, how often we flip right back to forgetting how good God is. 
and we start saying, God, why? And we're all guilty of that. But that's our fleshly human nature. So that's where Elijah's at here. He's already had a major prayer answer. Now, Elijah meets Ahab. And Ahab's a little different character. Go just a little bit forward to 1 Kings chapter 18 now. And we're going to begin in verse 17. He meets Ahab. Verse 17 of 1 Kings 18. It came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Something I shared this morning when I came uh, talking to Brother Mike. When I was sitting in the parking lot this morning, this parking lot will hold a lot of cars. There were roughly 10 or 12 cars out here. And I thought to myself, let's say it. That's what our churches are becoming. I very seldom fill in at a church or preach at a church where there's more than 20, 25 people. And these are the same churches that would have had 100, 150 people not too awful long ago. And now I think it goes back to what we're looking at here in 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 18. Ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord. That's where a lot of people are at now. They've given up on God and they're trusting the things of the world. Now, we have a lot of little gods running around in this world. We have a TV and a cell phone and everything else that promotes all these little gods. All the answers are out here so people quit coming in here. And I think we're living in a dangerous time, not if you're a Christian. If you're a Christian, it's an exciting time, because I wouldn't be surprised if the eastern sky didn't part of that, because, I mean, that's just the state of this world right now. But I think a lot of it goes back because we've forsaken the commandments of the Lord in general as a church. Verse 19, Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent all under the children, unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. 450 men. 450 prophets of Baal. One man of God. Does that sound familiar? How many good, faithful, Bible-believing preachers are in the world today? There are so many in-it-for-the-money preachers this day and age. And they preach what people want to hear. They're the ear ticklers. That was what I thought of when I read this. So we're going to leave that alone. But remind you here that we've already got 450 of Baal's prophets. But notice we also had 400 of the prophets that ate at Jezebel's table. So really we have 850 prophets here. And they're all for false gods. We know 450 of them are for Baal. Verse 23, let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on wood. Put no fire under it, and I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under it. And call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that hath answered by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. So now these people probably convinced in their minds that they're gods. Notice they didn't say, you pray to your God. Elijah said, pray unto your gods. So they were going to pray unto their gods and challenge them after they had dressed this bullock to destroy it with fire. And they thought this is no problem. So what happens? What happens is we see the false god of Baal to do nothing. Just as the worldly things that so many people are trusting in today 
can do nothing. So let's continue on with this story, verse 25. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves, dress it first, for ye are many. And call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under. And they took the bullock which was given them, they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. So now they're getting frustrated. They actually jump up on this altar. They're dancing around. They're begging. Oh, Baal, come on, destroy this thing. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he's talking or he's pursuing or he's in a journey or preventure, or perhaps he sleepeth and must be awake. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lances till the blood gushed out upon them. I thought of something when I thought of that too. How much do we see this day and age of people hurting themselves? They're cutting themselves. They're, they're doing terrible abuse of things to their bodies, trying to find something. We have a searching world right now. It's, it, and it's getting worse. I've done fire and EMS for 25 years. And I can assure you what's happening today in this world is far worse than it was 25 years. And it's a lot of it is people searching. It's sad. Because oftentimes, we have what they need. But how often do we pass those people by saying, we'll stay away from them. I don't want any parts of that. But God sends us to who and whosoever. I think of the maniac. The, 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 yeah. The maniac. Can't get that word actually. Think about the maniac. Nobody wanted to go near that. Jesus healed it. We have the Holy Spirit within us. We may have exactly what that person needs. Keep that in mind. We're going to touch on that more later. But they cut themselves until the blood gushed out upon them. So picture this. This isn't just a couple of people. You have, we know the 450 prophets of Baal for sure. We know they're dancing around. They're cutting themselves. They, they're making a bloody mess. And we assume, probably, we have also the 400 that was eating at Jezebel's table also doing the same thing. And they're creating a real big mess, but nothing's happened. Verse 29, And it came to pass, when midday was past, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that there was neither voice nor any answer nor any that regarded it. So there was absolutely no response from this Baal God or God of Baal that they were trusting him. Absolutely nothing. So now, we see Elijah. He creates an impossible situation because he wants to prove the power of his God. And he's going to put this to rest once and for all. Our God, keep that in mind. I keep saying Elijah and his God. That's our God. It's the same God. That's why the Old Testament's here for our teaching. This stuff we read, oftentimes people pass it off as stories. This is history. These things happen. This is the same God that we're serving today. People are going to see how God overcame the impossible. But what did it take? It took Elijah calling upon him. So let's get on with this. Verses 30 through 41. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he prepared the altar of the Lord that was broken down. He took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar, as great would contain two measures of seed. He put the wood in order, and cut the bullock in pieces, and laid it on the wood, and said, Fill four barrels with water poured on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Have you ever tried to start a fire when the wood's wet? <laughs> when it's cold? Yeah. Water is not a friend of fire. So we have water now. We have wet wood. We have a dressed bullock, which isn't readily going to burn. So it gets better. 34. He said, do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, do it the third time. They did it the third time. So now we're up to 12 barrels of water. 
The water ran about the altar and filled the trench also with water. So now these guys, if they still have conscience, consciousness, you have all these prophets of Baal, and they're looking at this saying, what's this guy doing? He's just, he's, they're probably laughing if they're able. But realize they just came out of the humiliation of seeing what Baal couldn't do. Then, verse 36, And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. He prayed. This is another fervent prayer of Elijah to God that came. And what happens? Verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. Capital G. The God. The one and only God. God. No Baal. No how many ever gods these gentlemen were, were praying to. No more. Just like today we have one true God. No matter how twisted and deformed this world wants us to think, there's still one God. And that God has that power. Let's go on to see what happens. I had originally going to stop there, but I continued on. Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. That's what God's going to do. God is going to take all these little gods that's wandering around the world now, promising people all this stuff. He's going to slay them. When it's said and done, folks, there's going to be one God, one God, the Son, Jesus Christ, and we're going to be in the presence. It's just going to be me and God, you and God, one on one. We're not going to be judged by a whole legion of gods. One God, same as it was here. And he slew all those little gods, just as he will the gods of today. Verse 41, And Elijah said unto Ahab, Ahab, Get thee up, eat, and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. Let's back to 1 Kings 17, 1, just for a second. I want to remind you of a verse. Keep in mind there the sound of abundance of rain. What did it say in chapter 17, verse 1 of 1 Kings? The last part of that. As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. The rain came after Elijah called upon his God and destroyed the prophets of Baal and proved the very power and might of God. There was a strong belief after they saw the power of God display on display. That was the other key to that. They fell on their faces and they believed. Why did they believe? Because they saw. How many people today must see to believe? How many people are not getting saved because they can't bring themselves to the faith of trusting something you can't see? It's saved. We're a, we're a, I want to see it to believe it culture right now. And it's dangerous. That's not true faith. True faith like that of Elijah prays believing that God will answer even though we can never see Him. Again, how many people will perish just because they'll never accept Jesus Christ by faith? We'll let go of Elijah now. We're going to look at the example of Hezekiah. He 
example of Hezekiah, if you flip back to 2 Kings now, 2 Kings in chapter 18. This is kind of a different thing. Here, Hezekiah is battling forces, as in militant forces, destructive forces. Elijah was facing more of a battle in the spirit world. This is bringing it down now to a physical realm. Hezekiah had heard that the king of Assyria was going to destroy his land and his people. And if you go back, which I encourage you to, if you go back in the book of 2 Kings and just read up to this, the king of Assyria was basically on a path destroying everything that came. Whatever got in the way, the king of Assyria and his armies, they destroyed it. Well, Hezekiah heard that this was going to happen to his land and his people. So look at 2 Kings 18, verses 29-33. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. Talking about God. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and this city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by present, and come out to me. Then eat ye every man of his own vine, every one of his fig tree, and drink ye every one of the waters of his cistern. Until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyard, a land of oil, olive and honey, and that ye may live and not die, and hearken not unto Hezekiah. And he persuadeth you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. So the king of Assyria is saying, you might as well just not even think about anything that Hezekiah is telling you. Hezekiah can tell you all day that the Lord's going to deliver you. But I'm telling you, unless you make an agreement with me, you're going to be destroyed. And he's making a promise there. Make an agreement with me with present. And he's telling him he'll take him to the land of this and that and everything else. But do not hearken unto Hezekiah. That was his main message. The Lord's not real. Hezekiah can tell you all day that the Lord will deliver you. I'm telling you, you're going to be destroyed. But, Hezekiah prayed to God that he would save them from utter destruction at the hands of the Assyrian army. Go to 2 Kings 19, verses 14 through 19. And again, I encourage you to read everything in between. It leads up to this. But in 2 Kings 19, beginning in verse 14. And Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. Lord, bow down thine ear and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes and see. And hear the words of Sennacherib, which has sent him to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations and their lands, and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone, therefore they have destroyed them. Kind of goes back to what we looked at at Baal there. What's he saying here when he's praying to God? Yeah, the king of Assyria has come through here. He's wiped out all these nations. He burn up their gods. He threw their gods into the fire. But Lord, I've told them that I have the true living God. It can't happen. So he's asking God in this prayer, show the king of Assyria who the real God is. Because he's not going to be able to go over the top of you and your people. Is what he's saying. In verse 19, Now therefore, O Lord our God, I beseech thee, Save thou us out of his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know thou art the Lord God, even thou only. Wow. That's a lot of faith. You think about that. What's that take? Let's say you're, put yourself in Hezekiah's shoes. You're a leader of a nation. What is it in present day form? Let's say you're the president of the United States. And you're getting all these bulletins. Hey, they're coming. They're going to wipe the United States off the map. It's going to be for you Muslims, for example. 
they're going to be, it's going to be a Muslim nation when this is all done. Can you imagine the President of the United States taking that declaration and going to the altar of God, laying it down, and praying to God for mercy and deliverance of God? Boy, wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> That'd be really wonderful. But that's what it takes. God is what's going to deliver our nation, just as he's delivered nations all through the book right here. God will deliver if this nation is to be delivered. Hezekiah knew that. Hezekiah, Hezekiah trusted that, and he prayed to that very God. God answered and delivered. 2 Kings 19, 32-35. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor cast a bank against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and he shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake, and for my servant David's sake. Verse 35, And it came to pass that night, that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred, fourscore, and five thousand. And when they rose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. That's 85,000. 85,000 Assyrian troops lay dead in the morning. What did Hezekiah do to kill them? Pray. He simply prayed. Hezekiah trusted and prayed, and I have to say it was probably a very fervent prayer from the heart. He trusted God, and he never had to raise a sword. God delivered, and Hezekiah and his people never had to even raise a sword against the army of Assyria. That's what we have to hold on to. We have to hold out hope that God's going to save us, because we can't, and I asked the question this morning, I went to a group that's probably right where I'm at, but if there was a larger group here, we'd probably get mixed answers. Are we still holding out that this world has the answer? Are we still holding out that our government has the answer? Are we still holding out that our stuff will save us and bring us hope and joy? So many people are grabbing for that hope and joy and I live for today attitude. You just sat and watched traffic on a weekend. You'll see how much people are grabbing from the stuff. And it just blows my mind. That stuff is all vanity. I learned that elsewhere in the Bible. It's all vanity. Read the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, came to the conclusion that it's all vanity. So what can we trust in? The one true God. Who can we pray to? The one true God. So we're going to go ahead and blow through this last example. And I'll just share something different tonight. The last one is probably the biggest miracle in my eyes because it affects me. The third example I have of the power of prayer to a God that came is salvation. I pray to the God that could. I didn't get saved until I was 32 years old. I think I shared that here before. And up till I was 32 years old, I was running the ways of the world. And many years of that, I was married. And I was a father. I wasn't a very good fatherly example at that point in time. But I prayed when I was 32 years old to the power of God that came, the only one. We are, as Christians, probably one of the biggest examples of God's power in prayer. And the reason I say that, yes, these, these blow your mind. When you think about what God did in these Old Testament times, it blows your mind. But we are in the present. People that know what I was, that saw what I became, that makes them think. They see what they consider to be impossible, made possible. How can someone change like that? How can that happen? What well, makes them start asking questions? And as Christians, we prayed a simple prayer of salvation 
and our God did a mighty work. He saved our soul. He paid the price for all of our sins, past, present, future. And that's precious. Just as I am. God accepted us as Christians just as we were when we came to Him for salvation. But He accepts us every day that our feet hit the floor and we get up. He accepts us just as we are that day. I may fail five times a day, but if I repent and go to that same God and I say, forgive me, Lord, I've sinned again. He's, he's going to forgive you. Scripture tells you if you're willing to forgive or you know, if you're willing to pray and admit that you've sinned and done wrong, He will forgive you. You'll never lose your salvation. Once you pray that prayer of salvation, you're saved. There's no doubt about that. But the precious part is you don't have to keep asking. But God loves it when we bow the knee and say, Lord, I failed you. Will you please forgive me today? We're still going to be in heaven, even if we don't bow the knee and ask forgiveness. But God's going to say, Child, why didn't you? Why did you do this? Why didn't you come to me and ask forgiveness? But it's not going to take away your salvation. He promised that if he... If we confess our sins, He will forgive us. And He'll never quit working on us, praise God. He cleansed us from all unrighteousness, made us new creatures. That's a miracle in itself. He broke the chains and held us in bondage to fear and lust of the world. I think lust of the world right now is the number one thing that Christian battles. Because we're Christians, we trust God, we know we're going to heaven. But what's every person want? Every person wants the stuff that makes you feel good. Every person, no matter who you are, wants the things that are fun. And what's out there today in this world, I shared earlier, that's what this world thrives on. You've got to have this. Yeah, this works, but boy, you need this. Yeah, I realize you got this last year, but boy, this one's way better. And they've drawn people into that. And it, it's terrible. But he takes those chains away we trust Him, He will provide our needs. And we have need of nothing else. Just content, be content in God. He moved into our hearts and dwells there forever as the Holy Spirit. A lot of people refer to the Holy Spirit as an it. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is a He. He lives in me. as part of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He lives within us. So keep that in mind and cling to that. He became a friend that's closer than a brother. If you ever needed a friend that you thought was a friend, and that friend disappeared, the world calls them fair-weathered friends. When I was 32 years old, I found out how many fair-weathered friends I had because when I got saved and I didn't want to do the good old boy things anymore, <laughs> I found a whole new pool of friends. But you know what? This new pool of friends are friends. These... They weren't so much friends. He promised He will never leave us nor forsake us. And for some of us, the journey we travel in life, we need that. We need that person that we know who will never leave us nor forsake us. He guides our footsteps through the forest and through the storms. If I ask for a raise of hands right now, people that's going through a storm, having issues, I guarantee you at least 50% of the hands will go up. But you know what's precious about Holy Spirit and God. We can be in the middle of the forest and we have no idea what's on the other side. But God does. And if we pray and we trust God to give us the next step, we will pop out the other side of the forest and we're going to see the sun again. We're going to be so happy that we just wait. Because I'm not a patient person. That's one of my downfalls. I run ahead of God. I want to get out of that woods, and I want to get out of the woods right now. So I take off. And then usually after I trip and fall three or four times, God rushes me off and says, why don't you just wait? And then I realize that I need to just wait for that next step. He promised he will come back for us and take us to our heavenly home that he has prepared. Matthew 11:28 28 says, Come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Anyone need rest this morning? How about you flip Matthew 7, verses 7 through 11. It won't be much longer, I promise. The print on my paper gets larger, so this third, don't let this third page go. 
Matthew 7, verses 7 through 11. This is the words of Jesus Christ, our Savior. He says, Ask, it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh, receive it. And he that seeketh, find it. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. For what man is there of you, whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? For we are the children of God. Verse 10, if he asks a fish, he'll give him a serpent. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask them? We pray because... We serve the same God as Elijah and Hezekiah. The God that created it all, he's over all, and can provide all if we ask. What did it take for Elijah to have prayer answered? What did it take for Hezekiah to have prayer answered? He asked. He prayed. Fervent prayer. Ask, just like it says here. Ask. Seek. True faith believes and trusts in things unseen, not the worldly solutions or things of the world. There's a song that, if you listen to modern gospel music, God sees the storm from the other side. I've already heard that song. Look it up if you have it. God sees the storm from the other side. Same as the forest. If you're going through a storm of life right now, pray to the God that knows where you're going to end up coming out of this. He will guide you through that storm. True faith trusts God through the forest and the storms. Our Father desires to hear from His children. Salvation is a relationship. We're putting out a lot of challenges this morning. I hope some of this is simple. He seeks a relationship with us. Salvation is not just, yep, yeah, saved, going to heaven now. No. It's just like your Father. When you were growing up, I know some of the most precious times I had growing up was spent with my father. We spent doing things together, talking. He would help me with issues. I would help him not do it because he was a smart one. But God's the same way. God leads us along just like that father-son relationship. And he literally is God the father. He is the smart one. So trust him. And that's what he wants. He wants that relationship. He desires that relationship. Many times when we're down, the only reason we don't reach to God and take His hand is because we never look up and see it. The hand's reaching. God's hand's always reaching. But it's when we get our focus down, we don't look up to take the hand. So that goes back to what we read in Matthew. We have not because we ask. Okay, so question, how are we doing? How's our prayer life? How is our walk with God? That's just a, that's a between you and God thing, not me. And keep in mind, Christians need to be that light reflecting God's light in this ever-darkening world. How many people will give up and give in because they have no hope? I think of the suicides. I think of the addictions. I think of the things that people do themselves just to try to appease what they think are their evil demons that are around them. Sometimes it only takes one person to reach out. I've heard story after story of someone that saw someone and they just felt led. And that's the Holy Spirit. And they'll say something to that person and they'll thank them. They'll talk and they'll say, you know what? I was contemplating suicide when you came Well, wouldn't it be great to be that person that saved someone's life just because you left the light of God shine off of you through you? They're the same people we rub shoulders with. These people that have no hope are the people we rub shoulders with. And I don't know how many of you know it, but I found this out a little while back. It blew my mind. I never really thought about it. Do you know that the moon only gets its light from the sun? I don't know. I wasn't that well educated in school because I didn't pay attention. But yeah, if we didn't have the sun, the moon would be dark. The light of the sun reflects off of the actual moon we see. Well, that's what we need to do. We need to be like the moon. We need to have the reflection of the sun coming off of us. 
the sun, S O N sun. Yeah. It should reflect off of us. So what people see, they see a light. Because we're in a dark world. At nighttime, it's dark. People see the moon. That's what they need to see. They need to see us in the dark. The challenge today is just basically evaluate how we're walking through this life with, with Christ. Are we that reflecting light? Are we praying to God as we should and trusting Him? Are we showing out what other people are going to want? I think the time's drawing near. I think our churches, our people, which is the church, we need to be on our knees and pray fervently for souls. Pray fervently for souls, but then be willing, if God puts someone in your path, go to that person. That might be the scariest looking, dirtiest person you've ever seen, but if you pray in the morning for God to give you a soul to save, and you encounter somebody during the course of the day that absolutely terrifies you, I can almost assure you that's the person that God put in your path. Approach that person with trust and faith in God. And lastly, our churches people need to bow the knee and pray fervently for the revival. Pray that once again we'd see our churches full. We would see pastors in the pulpit preaching the true word of God. Not preaching what doesn't hurt your toes. Not preaching this section of the Bible because, well, we have so and so in our church and they deal with this so I don't want to hurt their feelings. So we're going to skip this portion of Scripture. Pray for the day that we get pastors in the pulpit to preach the truth of God, unapologetically and true. We need revival in this country. I'm going to close with two verses. One we started with, James 5.16. James 5.16. I'm going to turn there again. And if you still have that, great. The second place we're going to be is in 2 Chronicles. James 5.16 Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another. That's the brotherhood. If you have a Christian brother and sister, you have someone you can trust. Get help. If you're struggling with something, find a Christian brother or sister that you can confide in and trust. And that's where our unity is. It's within our brotherhood, sisterhood. Pray one for another you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Our pastor challenged us a month or so ago, and this was more difficult than I thought. This, this, will, this will tell you how your prayer life's going. He challenged us every day to take 10 minutes of uninterrupted prayer. 10 minutes and spend just in prayer. Turn your cell phone off, turn everything off. 10 minutes in prayer. And I'll tell you what, when you try to do that, you don't realize how little time you spend in prayer. Because usually my prayer would probably be a two or three minute prayer and out the door. And it made me conscious of just how little time I spend in prayer. So think about that challenge. Ten minutes a day, uninterrupted prayer. And lastly, Second Chronicles 7.14. Of some of you already know what this verse is. Second Chronicles 7.14. This needs prayed over our nation because statistics show that the United States is a Christian nation. It shows that we're a Christian nation. So if we're a Christian nation, and I don't know how we got in the shape we're in, unless it's because people do not obey 2 Chronicles 7, 14. 2 Chronicles says, 14 says, If my people, that's Christians, folks, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Think about that. We're a Christian nation, but how are we going for prayer? I think there's, there's a lot of Christians that are getting drawn. So just pray for our churches in general, but pray for our our nation, we have an election coming up. Pray that people will vote the closest to the Bible. Just pray they separate. Forget about Democrat and Republican. Scrape that right off the table. Get in your Bible and pray and seek to vote for the Christian person. If there's not a Christian person running, find the one that's closest to the biblical principle of this country. And most of all, just pray and trust God. Just 
Let it go. Let it go. Let God lead. He will not fail us as we've seen this morning. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear precious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time that we can come together this morning. We thank you that we can come and do it in freedom. Lord, we, we hope to never, ever take that for granted. Lord, those who have given them their lives so that we may have these freedoms, let us not neglect them. Lord, I do pray for the church as I pray, Lord, that the churches would start to draw the people back. That people would realize that the time is drawing nigh. The Lord, your time is coming closer and closer, and we know your scripture tells us as the time draws near, the years will grow not. There will be a falling away of the church. And when you look at churches that went from 100 to 200 down to 20 to 25, 30, the churches are falling away. Lord, I feel we need to be prepared for the rapture, but Lord, at the same time, as long as our feet are still on your soil, we need to be faithfully praying and serving drawing souls into your your fold, Lord. Help, help us, Lord, to be faithful, God-fearing Christians in this dark and dying world. Lord, help us in Jesus' name.